Jasmine Balduck. Here. Jason Nelson. Here. Janelle Luauzo. Here. Jordan Diebler. Here. George Durango Espen. Here. Joshua Reynolds. Here. Caitlin Farrar. Here. Kyle Quinn. Here. Lakin Meter. Here. Lewis Richardson. Here. Marie Missiner. Here. Marissa Gillespie. Matthew DeAngelis. Here. Megan Neely. Here. <clears throat> Michael DeBoten. Here. Sorry, I thought you passed me. It's okay. Um, Michael Jablonski. Noah Robertson. Here. Patricia Barungi. Here. Raina Alexander. Here. Refugio Lara. Here. Ryan Lascalzo. Samantha Brown. Here. Samuel Aja. Here. Sean Terry. Here. Selena Go. Here. Seth Kornstein. Here. Steven Zhang. Here. Sydney Gibbard. Here. And Secretary Campos, um, Ryan is here. He's just in another class, so he wasn't able to document that. Okay. Um, aside from that, was there anybody's name that was not called? If so, please unmute yourself. Okay. Seeing none, we will now move on to the adoption of the agenda. Um, are there any mo motions to be raised? And if so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Representative Gibbard. Uh, yes, so I have a bunch of different ones. So I'm going to first motion to strike line item E, election for Pennsylvania Association of State Related Students pass liaison. Is there a second? Thank you. Um, and then I'm also going to motion to strike um, K, line item K, confirmation of executive director of student organization rights advisor Sora. Thank you. Um, and then I'm going to motion to like switch all the line numbers so that they sw switch up um, to how they would be accordingly <laughs> to that. Thank you for the second. Um, and then I motion to add all the names on the document that I sent out earlier as far as like confirmation names. So um, line item E will be Kelly, F is Tony, G is Brian Culler and Amy Gary, H is Eric Suarez. I is Tim Tierney, and then J is Nikhil Chowdhury. Thank you for those seconds and a third. That's it, thank you. Representative Robertson. Hi, I'd like to motion to add resolution 116 to the agenda. Um, not sure which like line item and new business that might go. And item L. Okay. I'm um, seeing that there's a second that has now been added. Are there any other motions to be made? Okay. Seeing none, we will now move on to the adoption of the minutes. Is there any discussion on the past meeting minutes? If so, please raise your hand. Okay. Seeing no discussion on the adoption of the past general meeting minutes, we will now hear a special presentation from Brian Kohler, the student trustee on NextGen Penn State. Um, Brian Kohler, welcome. Um, just for context, you will have five minutes to speak and 10 minutes for questions. Um, I will cut you off after five minutes um, and you may start whenever you're ready. Um, would you mind letting me know if you have screen sharing abilities, if you do have a presentation? Uh, I do and I think I should have uh, capabilities. There. Perfect. All right, I'll start your time now. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so I think I already introduced myself to most of you um, when I was here for the retreat in uh, a different <laughs> capacity, but um, I'm here today to do a little bit of an update from the Board of Trustees. Um, I'm going to focus 
more so on uh, Next Gen Penn State, um, which technically is a, a little separate from the board, um, but I think that it's timely and I wanted to make sure that you all had the information in front of you uh, before uh, the time passed for uh, student input. So um, just briefly, um, a little bit about the board for anyone who's not familiar. Uh, we have 38 members and we're responsible for the governance and welfare of the university. Um, we have a committee structure very similar to how UPUA operates. Um, I currently sit on the Academic Affairs Research and Student Life Committee, as well as the newly formed Equity and Human Resources Committee. Um, so I, I'm not going to uh, go into too much depth uh, on those tonight, um, just because I want to be respectful of time. Um, but one of the other things that is perhaps the largest responsibility of the board is the uh, recruitment and selection of the university's president. And as some of you may have seen in uh, the last month or two, um, President Barron has since announced his intention to uh, retire in July of 2022. Um, and so we are beginning the process now of getting to um, start to figure uh, to get through our process of selecting the next president. So um, a little bit about what we're calling Penn State Next Gen. Um, so Penn State Next Gen is part of the Board of Trustees uh, listening process. Um, so this is really the, an opportunity for the board and, and uh, the university leadership to solicit input from all of our various stakeholders on um, the types of things we should be prioritizing and the things that we should be considering when it comes to selecting our next president. Um, so that has broken down into three main parts. Um, the first being the Next Gen Penn State Advisory Group. Um, this is what I'm a member of. It's a um, 47 member group. Um, if my memory serves me, there are about five students on it. Um, and that group is doing calls in smaller sections amongst themselves um, with the search firm that is uh, helping us with the uh, recruitment of the next potential president um, to talk about, you know, priorities and things like that, uh, that we have as a group. Um, but we're also trying to go out to our respective uh, constituencies and groups and, uh, you know, solicit feedback from um, each of those parties, uh, which is what I'm here to do today. Um, and then additionally, we have uh, the survey, which is open now. Um, I'm going to have a link to it on the next slide. Um, that is open to anyone, uh, Penn State students, alum, uh, faculty, staff, um, anybody who would like to answer it. Um, there's, um, it's only a handful of questions. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more on the next slide. Um, but it basically serves the purpose, the purpose of informing our recruitment and selection committee on the uh, priorities of you know, the, the broader constituencies of Penn State. Um, the Recruitment and Selection Committee is a group of, um, I think, entirely tr trustees um, plus like one faculty and one student. Um, I believe President Bose is actually the student representative on that committee. Um, and they will do the actual vetting of candidates and the recommendation to the board for final approval of our next president. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the process that we go through in the next couple months here. Um, next Gen, as like a listening process, will wrap up. Um, by the end of May, I believe, and then we'll turn things over to the recruitment and selection committee from there. Um, and so um, in that time, uh, here's the link to our next gen survey, uh, the QR code should take you there. Um, and the first couple of questions, just to give you a little bit of a sense of what you might be getting. Um, first thing it asks is about what you think characteristics of a good president would be. Um, and then it also asks you about um, opportunities for Penn State in the next few years. Um, I would encourage you as you fill this out to consider um, you know, the wide variety of um, responsibilities that the university president has at Penn State. So Penn State owns, uh, you know, a couple of hotels and we also are, um, you know, obviously multifaceted in that we have um, a campus structure, a Commonwealth campus structure, as well as a world campus and university park, which is obviously our biggest campus. Um, but, you know, keep all these things in mind as you think about the things that are important for a university president. Um, you know, things that you've thought that President Barron did well, things that you think he could have improved on, um, all valid things to include in the survey. And we're really just looking to get um, honest feedback from uh, the student, from students, uh, especially through this process. So I would encourage you all to, you know, take the survey yourself, share it with your group, share it with your orgs, um, and then the search firm will do the uh, amalgamating of all of the responses so that uh, next gen and then eventually the uh, search and recruitment committee can review them. So I want to leave some time for any questions or, you know, feedback. Um, I, you know, there's been a little bit of, uh, I guess, sentiment amongst some students that there wasn't enough opportunity for students to weigh in on this uh, with their voice. And so that's kind of why I'm here is to, you know, to hear anything that you all have to 
uh, to say to this uh, advisory group before we hand things over to uh, the selection and recruitment team. So um, I, I can answer board questions too, if you would like me to, but uh, you know, next gen is kind of the pressing thing. Um, oh, I think the survey closes, uh, I think it's next Friday. So you have, you know, only you know, a couple of days left to get that done. So, you know, please do that one as soon as you can. Thank you, student trustee Kohler. Um, I'm now opening up the floor for any questions that you may have. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I will call on you. We will start off with representative Nelson. Jason Nelson, Lion Pride. My main question is that I've seen these types of student surveys done in academic settings before, but most of the time they're not given very much, they end up not given, being given very much weight. They, they're more so just checking off a box so that the trustee board can say that they listen to the students. Will you personally have access to the results of the survey? And it, uh, either way, do you have, is there any way to reassure that the students will, will be listened to in this process? So the way that this is going to work is that the survey is actually hosted by Spencer Stewart, which is the search firm that is uh, helping Penn State with our with our process. Um, so they will uh, collect all the data and they're going to, uh, you know, provide like a, a data report out. Um, I will be part of the group that reviews that. And, you know, I can assure you that I will, um, you know, push for the student uh, considerations and advice to be taken uh, seriously. Um, and, you know, obviously there's, you know, other other opportunities through, um, you know, like for example, Aaron's uh, role on the uh, search and recruitment committee as well uh, for student input to really be heard in a strong way. And so um, I, I think I can I can say pretty confidently that it, uh, the feedback is really being taken seriously, and you know it's why we're soliciting it in this way. Um, so so I'll say yes that you know I'll I'll do my best to make sure that happens. Thank you, Representative Nelson. Representative Zhang. Good evening at large. Uh, thanks for coming in. Well, I guess we'll see each other a lot more now, Brian, but um, two, two quick questions. One, I'm curious as to if you are, if you understand or if you had access to um, the process on how they selected the students for both next gen and for the presidential search committee. Like, was it just a, you know, we're just going to pick someone or was there considerations or, or an application process or something like that? Um, and then the second question is, do you know if uh, in terms of outreach for listening sessions, is it going to be specifically reaching out to the community? Let's say like, oh, like, let's talk, like, let's reach out to the caucuses, let's reach out to these different communities on campus, or is it just kind of like a broad, you know, Penn State news push and then expecting students to come? So to answer your first question, um, the next gen uh, advisory group that I am on was selected by the board. Um, so because the, the presidential selection process is kind of one that's the board's responsibility. Um, most of that uh, decision making falls within uh, within the board's leadership. Um, so the board leadership picked this group of um, of students, faculty, staff, alumni, donors um, to to fill this group uh, so that we could get a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, it's also uh, and and trustees is the other category that's in that advisory group. Um, and so the selection that was done by um, the chair of our of this next gen process, which is actually the vice chair of the board, David Kleppinger, um, and, and he made those decisions um, with the leadership team uh, within the board uh, on who was a part of these groups. Um, as for, uh, remind me the second part of the question, sorry. Yeah, um, in terms of outreach for, for the next gen meeting sessions, like how direct is that going to be? Yeah, so the search firm has set up, oh, I can't remember the the number that they've done in total of these listening sessions, um, but they have targeted them at what we think is a wide variety of groups. Um, they spoke with uh, the student leader roundtable that Damon organizes. Um, I believe that they had another listening session that was for, um, if they haven't had one that's for the caucuses yet, I believe that was in, in the works. Um, and so they have been deliberate about going to um, I think a diverse, a, di a diverse mix of, um, of stakeholders. And so uh, granted that that stakeholder list includes, you know, like I said, alumni and faculty and things like that. So, you know, they can't spend uh, you know, tremendous amounts of time interviewing, you know, every little group of students. Um, but I think that they have made a conscious effort and uh, within student leader Roundtable, we even push them to, uh, to make a little bit, uh, cast a little broader of a net um, in these last couple of weeks in terms of the types of students that they talk to. But it's not just, it's not strictly just, uh, I guess, unsolicited, if that's what, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, gotcha, thanks. Yep. 
thank you, Representative Zhang. Representative Terry. Hi, uh, yeah, just two quick questions, Sean Terry at large. Um, I just wanted to say, are, are the, the search for the president, is that internal and external or just external for, for options like for who we're picking? Um, and also, will the report that the, the, they're surveying right now, will that be released to the general student body or is that strictly just for the Board of Trustees? And, and if that is being released, is there any way that the student government can have access to that? So um, to answer the first part of the question, um, I would assume that internal candidates will be considered as well. Um, I think that that, you know, any candidate vetting is up to the search and recruitment team. Um, and so it's up to them, but I, I, it would shock me to learn that internal candidates wouldn't be considered in addition to external candidates. Um, and then for the second part of your question, I actually just saw, I was on the website today um, where they had a question about whether or not these results would be uh, public. Let me pull it up because I actually have it right here. Um, and I will answer that. If they are public, I would certainly say that the student government would be able to uh, review that. Um, yeah, so the, on the on the next gen Penn State website, um, which I'm sharing the particular FAQ in the chat with you all right now. Um, and you can feel free to this is for that specific question, but you can you can look at the others as well. Um, it says that the report will be eventually made public. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, student trustee Kohler and representative Terry. Um, we have three more minutes for any questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. And if not, we will move on. Najee, can I add quickly? Um, so uh, additionally, last time I was here, I talked to you all about the fact that uh, we were in the middle of our process for selecting my replacement as a student trustee. Um, my term is expiring in uh, my last meeting will be in about two weeks now, um, and then my term will actually expire on June 30th. Um, so we ha have uh, selected a student preferred candidate from our selection committee, um, and we have passed that along through a first round of uh, like a small trustee group review uh, successfully. Um, all that's left now is for the official uh, stamp of approval from the governance committee in May. Um, which which should be a pretty uh, smooth process. So um, I'm excited that we have you know what I think is a really strong candidate. Um, and you know I, I know that uh, former President McKay has mentioned to you all about his service on that committee. And so uh, we really had a good group that helped us to, to pick what I think is going to be a really great representative um, on the board. So look for that in May. Thank you, Student Trustee Kohler, and we look forward um, to voting on your confirmation later on in the meeting. Thank you so much for presenting to us today. Thanks, everybody. Um, before I move on, may I have a motion to suspend the rules? Um, I will then make a motion to reinstate them after the next presentation um, for the same reason that we will go over the five minutes most likely, um, but it's extremely important that we are thorough um, in the process. Okay, in a second, okay, perfect. So the rules are temporarily suspended. Um, and that being said, we will now move into a special presentation from Speaker Gibbard, President Bose, and myself, a presentation on the UPUA organizational restructuring. Um, Speaker Gibbard, you should have powers to screen share who you are. And without further ado, um, you may start whenever you're ready. Great, um, hi everyone. So um, I apologize for the abundance of emails you've received from me over the past two days, um, but we're just trying to be thorough and I'm just trying to get all the information to you so that you're prepared for next week's week meeting so that it goes as efficiently as possible. I know it's the week before finals um, and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So that's why we're giving this presentation on organization restructuring today instead of next week. Um, you won't be voting on any legislation today re relating to this today. It won't be until next week. Um, and we'll, re we'll go over the legislation again next week. Um, so you don't have to worry about that entirely. And I can share this presentation with you, I already have. So if you have any questions, you can refer to that. Um, but basically what we'll be talking about today is kind of a vision from the executive branch and judicial and legislative branch in how we wanna restructure U UPA so that it can be the most efficient possible. Um, and also just combining roles that overlap a little bit and from previous recommendations from previous administrations. So. With that, um, I'm actually going to start off with the legislative branch, which you are all a part of, so you are probably very familiar with this. Um, uh, there are 20 at-large members of the legislative branch. There are 14 academic representatives, um, and these don't just come from like the normal degree conferring colleges like College of Engineering and SNEAL, but they also come from Shire Honors College and DUS. 
Um, we also have two first year representatives and these representatives are elected in August um, or September time um, by the steering committee. They are brought to you for confirmation um, and they are first year students that are meant to represent that body of students. Um, we also have um, these two little last boxes over here. Um, we have a maximum one, stu one student representative from student identity organizations. Um, an example of this type of organization would be PanHel, IFC, um, and we also have at least one rep and um, up to two reps from inherent identity organizations like Black Caucus, Latino Caucus. And so uh, we made this distinction last year after um, several different conversations with the J board and with the legislative body and executive body. So um, that is just kind of the layout of the legislative branch and it is headed by the speaker of the assembly. Um, so as far as the um, qualifications for the legislative branch and kind of their purview, um, what they do is determine the opinion of UQA and as such, undergraduate students of Penn State, which is why we do outreach. And we are looking to reflect as, as accurately as possible uh, what the Penn State undergraduate body believes. Also um, regulate the expenditures of UQA. Um, we will be going over the budget next week. That's a huge part of that. Also establishing the rules governing the elections, appointment, performance, and qualifications of all members. Um, that's when we make those changes to the constitution and bylaws. And finally, um, consent to appointments of non-elected offices in all branches. So that's what we will be doing later today as far as confirmations um, where the president or the speaker will present you with an appointment for someone on a different branch and you will be able to vote on them and approve whether or not you think that they represent our organization's values. So with that. I will now go into discussion about the general overview of the judicial branch. Um, which is fair, a little more simplistic in terms of, um, of course, position and the processes and in, in which um, actions may go through. Um, so it's, of course, headed by a chief justice, which is uh, Chief Justice Zaya. Um, he has eight justices underneath him. And then currently we have nine judicial clerks that can be subject to change depending on how many um, how many of those students may express interest or may wish to be part of kind of the overarching judicial branch as mentees within that uh, program. Um, moving on to the general overview, um, the responsibilities of the judicial branch, of course, include um, conduct select hearings related to disputed matters within the UPA, specifically pertaining to representative removal, election disputes, disciplinary actions, disputes concerning the interpretation of the governing documents, and hearings related to student organizational conduct. They also review all UPA amendments to the governing documents, unless otherwise specified for fairness and equity. Um, upon their decision, um, they will then, of course, approve of the amendment that was passed. Um, and then that's how that's reinstated into our governing documents. Um, they vet all RSOs that apply for community group representative seat, um, whose applications are reviewed every fall session. So coming up, um, groups have the ability to apply and of course potentially receive a seat within the assembly. Um, they can also determine the placement of whether a community group falls under the categories of student identity or inherent identity. Um, and this is important because for example, with inherent identity groups like Black Caucus and Latino Caucus, it's of course um, the UPA's desire to advance and ensure equity um, from all underrepresented groups. Hence um, the extra seat that has been um, kind of established for inherent identity groups in the past assembly. Um, and you'll probably learn more about that in the future um, too. Um, there's a lot of nuances behind this. Um, you are, they're also responsible for comp compiling a report um, recommending to the assembly which of the RSOs that have applied that qualify for a seat in the assembly. And they also have the ability to revoke community group recognition in the event that the RSO has ceased to fulfill um, those specific clauses that are listed um, that you may look at um, on your own time. So the final um, branch that, that is within UPA is the executive branch. I do want to kind of alert everybody that this is the proposed changes. Um, and this is what the outlook of the branch would look like based off of the policy changes um, that Speaker Gibbard, Vice Chair Rodriguez and, and I have, have formulated. So you can see obviously the president, the vice president and chief of staff, um, which is then broken up into the different departments. Um, the departments of finance, records, environmental sustainability, and Sora are all um, exactly the same as, as we've seen in the past year. The two main differences that we're making in these pr proposed changes is one, the Department of Public Relations and two, the Department of Committee Relations. Um, we'll get more into what that actually means and, and the logistics of what those changes would mean later. Um, but basically the, the vision that, vice, that um, vice President Rodriguez and I have 
for the executive branch is we want to make sure that within the structures and gaps that we've filled within previous assemblies, um, we wanna make sure that there's also that efficiency, communication and collaboration instilled into the structure of the executive branch. Um, and hopefully with combining the Department of Communications and Department of Outreach, which we'll talk about later into the Department of Public Relations, that easily um, increases that communication and collaboration um, within the entire organization and specifically within our proposed change of the Department of Committee Relations, hopefully that will increase collaboration um, and efficiency between the executive and legislative branches specifically. So the executive branch on a, on a very zoomed out level um, carries out the will of the assembly and the EPA is prescribed by duly passed acts within the president's discretion. We provide services to students. Um, we conduct the day-to-day -day affairs of the EPA represent the UPA to the university and solicit university support, facilitate the selection of non-elected officials, which is again, what we're gonna be doing tonight, whose appointments are not governed um, by, by the rules of the branches. And we also establish the rules of procedure for the efficient operation of the executive branch, which is again, um, one of the acts that we're doing tonight, bringing, bringing upon these proposed changes for the executive branch. I will now specifically discuss um, the Department of Public Relations, which of course is a proposed change to the governing documents. Um, so of course, the original idea with this was of course, um, understanding and, and acknowledging the outreach in the communication departments being separate entities since the establishment of the Justice and Equity Committee in the beginning of the 15th. Um, so while these separate entities accomplished their stated goals, there was a lack of efficiency between the two groups whose roles often overlapped with each other. Um, and of course, as added reinforcement, the end of the year report from former executive director of outreach, Aphrodite Bizwas, um, said, I know a lot of people in the previous assembly were skeptical about combining outreach and communications, but having served in the role and actually executing all the responsibilities associated with both departments, I see it to be absolutely doable. So with that um, kind of statement, and of course, just feedback that we garnered, um, we have of course a new vision um, within the Bose Rodriguez administration to recommend the following changes. So essentially it's recommended to establish the Department of Public Relations, which would wholly contain outreach and communications. Um, and while this reorganization will not remove any responsibilities, it will restructure the way that the work is divided, managed and separated, which of course would increase efficiency overall. So I won't um, read everything here word by word. Basically what it does is we basically copied the communications department um, like responsibilities and charges within the constitution and put that as a sub clause underneath the department of uh, public relations. And we did the same thing um, with outreach as well. You can see on this next slide. Um, but just the important thing as far as labeling and uh, referring to these departments, there is a um, leading executive director of public relations, and then beneath them, a director of communications, and then a director of outreach. And those two directors will ultimately report to that um, executive director of public relations. Um, I've had a few questions actually about um, this, this clause right here that says, this director shall be granted the same responsibilities and rights of executive directors. So just to explain that a little bit further, um, basically what that means is that person will be allowed to have their own deputy director and directors underneath of them that they can delegate tasks to. Um, it just makes it so that they are also required to attend meetings with the cabinet um, and with the president and vice president and chief of staff. Um, it basically just makes their role very similar to executive director, um, but they're still underneath that overarching executive director of public relations. So now moving into the Department of Committee Relations, which is more so of a, a new, new proposed change rather than just a combination of two. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So basically in the past, before last assembly, we did used to have um, specific it would be usually only one executive member um, that for each committee that would serve and, and sit and collaborate with the chairs, vice chairs and the committees to make sure that there was that communication bridge between the legislative and executive branch. Um, in the past year, we switched that over to committee staffers. Um, committee staffers, we, we've kind of realized in the past year and hearing a lot of feedback and, and we've engaged in a lot of conversations with members from, from last assembly um, and, and even members coming into this assembly too about the need for that efficiency and communication between the two branches. Um, this really helps when, it, especially when you're carrying out initiatives 
Um, departments such as the communications and outreach department can help put together graphics and put out the information of the stuff that the legislative branch is doing. Um, and so having executive members within the room um, that are able to directly go back and report to the executive branch as their main responsibility, not only alleviates some of the responsibilities and, and burden um, that's put onto the legislative branch, it just fosters that collaboration and efficiency a lot, a lot nicer. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Basically what we'll be establishing is um, this overarching department of committee relations. Um, we didn't wanna have a specific executive director of this. It would mainly just be um, reporting right to Sarah. It, Sarah would serve as the executive director as the chief of staff, um, which makes it so that there's not like, it, it just fits it nicely into the structure that other departments also have of, of being underneath of a department. Um, but this Department of Committee Relations would have five executive boards for each of the standing committees. And basically, um, these executive boards would um, be able to have staff underneath of them as well, which is why you'll see that similar clause that Sydney had, had uh, said before that the directors are given the same rights and responsibilities as executive directors, which basically ensures that they can have those deputy directors underneath of them to provide additional support as well as being um, included as members of the cabinet that will help um, within those cabinet meetings and, and within the vetting processes, allow for that really increased communication um, and, and the, need, the, the, the need to not talk to multiple people in order to get one thing done um, and, and just that efficiency and, and collaboration. Um, so that, that was kind of a lot um, to throw into one thing. Again, we do have a full week um, that, that everyone can look these, this stuff over, but at the moment, um, especially since you've had time in Sydney's email, are there any questions that any of you have about any of the proposed changes? And before we get into that, may I have a motion to reinstate the rules to enact the 10 minutes? Thank you, and I see a second. Okay, so we'll now open the floor up for questions and we will have 10 minutes to address those. Please raise your hand if you have any questions on the proposed changes or on the overall presentation and I will call on you. Representative Robertson. Hi, so my question is about like the specific charges of the executive directors of the committees. So if their responsibility is to like facilitate the logistical operations within each committee. Um, and it, I'm not sure if that really touches on like the communication there, but that was just like the charge that I read in that one slide. How is that, is that different from say like a legislative staffer? And is that kind of taking away like each committee's ability to appoint its own staff? Um, and like, are you looking to transition that over to like more of an executive branch position? So um, we specifically didn't take out the language within the constitution and bylaws for legislative staff. So that's definitely still a capability that committees can, can have. Um, however, we're really encouraging the use of, this, of these executive boards, mainly because in the past, the legislative staff themselves have taken on that role of, of trying to communicate between the executive branch, but they specifically aren't charged to sit on any executive branch meetings or be within those um, areas for collaboration of the executive branch. Um, so these executive boards would put executive branch members right into the room with, um, with the committees in order to then go back to the executive branch meetings and um, kind of explain and, and, and delegate the tasks that are needed within the committees. Representative Flegel. Hi, yes, can I get the context behind um, Um, the context behind the idea of public relations. Sorry about that. My mic cut out for a second. Yeah, of course. Um, so with the Department of Public Relations, um, we obviously wanted to reorientate kind of the direction of communications overall, and of course have that overarching responsibility um, of these two specific um, departments of outreach and communications. A new focus that I think oh, public relations would essentially have is the creation and dissemination of content that would include like press releases, news features, and marketing collateral materials. It would also allow for a focus on media training competency, um, and it would ensure like editorial and visual compliance with EPA editorial policies, 
and it would allow and charge an individual to create a UPUA branding guide, which is absolutely essential when it does come to the idea of ensuring that there is that marketing to students, because that is how advocacy works in regards to that. Um, with outreach, that is more so the external facet of this like new department, whereas communications is the more internal um, facet uh, in terms of taking requests from committees, ensuring that the graphics are created, ensuring that there is a mechanism to create videos, um, and of course, having an individual who has competence with design experience, writing and editing skills in Microsoft Office Suite, Adobe uh, CS Suite, um, and publication layout um, kind of skill sets that are required for a position like this. Um, so really what it does is embolden our idea. Um, and I think that's really important that embolden the idea of communication and emboldens the idea of what this department could be capable of. I think it's important that we pursue that. So hope that clarifies that. Um, Representative Nelson. Jason Nelson, Lion Pride. I was just wondering what was the rationale between uh, limiting the student <clears throat> The student identity uh, represent or constituency groups to one representative, and then uh, putting no limit on the uh, the intrinsic identity groups. Well, I do, you know, obviously favor having intrinsic identity groups receive more representation, and of course, being uh, further franchised through the enhanced representation. Uh, I was just wondering why that wouldn't be the same for some of the other groups, just to make it a bit more fair. Yeah. Thank you for that question. I can actually quickly answer that. That's um, not part of the proposed changes this time around. This is just an explanation of what already exists that was passed in the 15th um, in terms of the governing documents and the institutionalized idea of that. Um, I actually worked on that with Representative Descalzo and essentially what that just aimed to do is increase the representation from inherent identity groups. Um, for example, Black Caucus and Latino Caucus and Lion Pride to ensure that these underrepresented communities were guaranteed um, a further seat and further representation within the assembly, given deficits that we've had in the past. Did I answer that question? Yes, thank you. Of course, yeah, thank you. Um, Representative Zhang? Stephen Zhang at large. Um, yeah, I, I really like how these changes really uh, moved to, to propose at least, um, I think, more streamlining a lot of the communications and, and a lot of the processes that we kind of seen um, that, that really kind of hindered assembly last year in terms of um, the bureaucracy and just making everything super complicated. Uh, my, my question is, I know one of the things last year that we talked about was how, for example, um, it was difficult for, for chairs uh, and for legislative branch to operate, especially with um, a, a stronger executive branch in terms of saying, oh, like, let's wait for graphics on the exec side and that just becoming a hindrance in terms of um, you know, not having enough staff on the exec side to carry over and also just the general bureaucracy of having to go cross branch for some of these uh, resources. You know, of, of course I'm, you know, for these changes, but at the same time, um, I'm wondering what we can do to, to remedy those communication issues or even like, you know, what, what's the rationale, but uh, with let's, you know, have these committee uh, executive directors, um, you know, also be on a, a bit more exec heavy um, and also be a bit more heavy in terms of communications on the exec side when we had those issues last year of um, just not getting everything done timely on the legislative side. Absolutely. So um, that actually spurred the exigence of these proposed changes. Um, so basically, in the past with the committee staffers, those were legislative seats, um, meaning that within the different committees and, and within these different conversations, it was all legislative members who then were tasked at seeking out executive branch members in order to carry through things like graphics, putting things in the newsletter, putting things on the website. The um, creation of these executive boards basically would put the executive boards and the committees within the same room. So when committees are meeting, executive boards would also be there. Um, so instead of chairs, for example, I know last year felt especially overburdened with having to keep track of, of the additional members that were coming through the executive branch. Um, so basically having both of these branches within the same room in these conversations um, would allow the executive boards then to take the conversations and take even the resolutions and the visions for the ideas, understand the context and understand the vision that's behind these resolutions and initiatives and take them back into the meetings that they're required to go to within the executive branch and effectively communicate with people like the director of communications, the social media managers, et cetera. Um, so that everybody is, the, the branches are kind of included in, in, in all of the meetings so that there's not that additional need to have a, an overabundance of, of communication when it could be um, more, more efficiently done. 
If I could just add to that really quickly. Um, I think that like some of the terminology we were using when we were creating the policy is thinking of the committee directors as a chief of staff for each individual committee and um, them reporting um, to the overarching chief of staff within the executive branch and seeing that exact um, line of communication there. Also the idea that um, last year when people wanted graphic requests, they would typically fill out a form and then set up a follow-up meeting to communicate their vision with the Department of Outreach or D Department of Communications. Um, and with having the committee directors in, um, in place who will be attending both committee meetings weekly and then also cabinet meetings weekly, um, the idea is that there should be no longer than a week turnaround for requests like that um, because they will be in both those meetings um, and understand the vision the same way. Um, to answer Representative Robertson, it will be coming next week. This is just a pre uh, presentation and preparation. Um, you do have a minute and 26 seconds, and this will be your second time speaking, um, and you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, so one thing that was noticeably absent for me, I guess it's like two questions, but one was like the, did you get feedback from the, uh, the current, um, what's the word, like the current group of people who are executive directors, the, yeah. And then two is, uh, I really liked how the sustainability department was split up into like the three other departments. And one thing that was missing was the Department of Rights and Equity. And I wasn't sure if you had plans to include that in the executive branch as well. Exactly. So one of one of my main concerns with with bringing this was I wanted to make sure that before we brought these proposed changes, I talked to all of the um, executive directors from the McKay Pathical Administration, as well as the um, 15th Assembly's committee chairs as well. Um, so all of that was taken into account and I had all I had conversations extensively with all of those um, executive directors and committee chairs. And one of the biggest concerns that all of them had had from the past year was that need for increased collaboration. Um, specifically talking with the executive director of rights and equity, he specifically pointed out that at many times he felt as if his department felt what was, was an exact replica of the Justice and Equity Committee and he wished that there was the ability to work more so coinciding within the Justice and Equity Committee. So the idea came to, to bring, especially because the initiatives that he had been tackling the past year um, coincided or it, it extremely rep replicated um, the, the work that was done within the Justice and Equity Committee. Um, he suggested bringing that work into the Executive Board of Justice and Equity as well. Okay, um, and that is all the time that we have for questions. Um, again, thank you all for asking those and please feel free to reach out. This policy will be voted on or this collection of policies will be voted on next week. This is just a presentation and preparation of that. Um, so thank you all. Um, we will now move into Open Student Forum. Um, is there a student here that is here for Open Student Forum? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Okay, seeing none, we will now hear a report by President Bose. President Bose, you may begin whenever you're ready. Hi again, everybody. Um, so I hope that everyone's enjoying the second to last week of classes. I don't know how we got here so quickly already, um, but I also hope that you're having a good time exploring all the different committees. Um, I'm extremely, um, I, I know that you guys will have the, the best time exploring them and finding your home within UPUA. Um, Thank you to student trustee Culler for explaining about the next gen survey. Please, please, please not only fill this out yourself, but encourage other students and community members to do so as well. Um, the, the feedback in the report will be only as effective as the outreach that we have um, within that process. So please make sure to fill that out. Um, I've also been finishing up some of the transitional work and have greatly enjoyed learning about the 15th Assembly's executive directors. Um, as we just presented, Speaker Gibbard, Vice President Rodriguez, and I have met extensively this week to not only um, talk about the proposed changes to the executive branch, but also to discuss the budget, which you'll see next week. The Student Fee Board is going to meet for the first time this Friday at 8 a.m. Um, I'll also be attending the Tuition Task Force on Friday. Um, again, I put this in my report last week, but the International Student Recruitment Task Force is looking for representation from UPUA. If you're interested, please reach out to me as soon as possible. I've also been in contact with the International Student Council um, to try and get, uh, garner interest there as well. Um, 
Also, I am in the process of setting up introductory meetings with the university leadership and members of the President's Council, which most likely will happen over the summer. Um, and please just on that note, as you get the ball rolling on initiatives, please make sure to CC me on all emails or at least president at upa.org um, just to make sure that there's that open line of communication um, and we can all stay on top of what's going on. Um, as was earlier meant, uh, motioned by Speaker Gibbard, we did strike the confirmation of Executive Director of Sora. I was hoping to explain a little bit of why we um, motioned to strike that confirmation. So in discussions with steering, we concluded that the position was not necessary to fill immediately. And instead it, it would be more advantageous, advantageous in the fall. Um, and also with it being such a crucial and intricate role, we wanted to be fully confident that the director had a holistic um, understanding of the Office of Student Conduct and the various responsibilities given to this position. You'll see this throughout the rest of the year, but my main philosophy for filling positions is that we should be diligently evaluating candidates based on their ability and aptitude to fill the role and not on the number of applications that we've received. Therefore, I've decided to reopen the applications for the position, which would allow previous candidates to gain a better understanding of Sora and also allow for other interested students to apply. The applications are most likely gonna close at the end of the summer, um, but please let me know if you have any questions about that decision. I'd be more than happy to answer. Um, in the meantime, please take care of yourselves. Make sure you get vaccinated and reach out if you need anything. And please, good luck on finals and prioritize your mental health always. Um, I'll stand for questions. Hi there. Are there any questions for President Bose? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Okay. Thank you, President Bose. Seeing none, I will now move on to my report. I will begin with the land acknowledgement. Um, I accidentally uh, committed an infringement on the governing documents because it is not officially a part of the agenda. So I'll be reading this in my report until it is potentially passed next week. Um, the University Park Undergraduate Association acknowledges that the Pennsylvania State University campuses are located on the original homelands of the Erie, Haudenosaunee, Lenni Lenape, Shawnee, Susquehannock, and Wazi nations. It is important to acknowledge the history of displacement that led to Penn State's establishment. It is crucial for us as the University Park student government to reflect and address the complicated past of exploitation of indigenous peoples by our university so that we can remain educated representatives of Penn State. This of course is credited to the Indigenous People's Student Association. And with that, I will move on into my original report. Um, to start, I got my second dose today of the vaccine and somehow I'm persevering. You all can do it, get vaccinated, highly encourage it. I'm just internally not doing great. Um, last week, um, the previous Justice and Equity team met with Dr. Griffin and other UHS administrators to advance the uh, next steps for the Wellness Fund and Center for Health Equity. We are now meeting um, next in May to discuss the logistical implementation of the Wellness Fund. So that's super exciting. Um, today, I actually met with Borough and University administrators to finalize the Every Student Belongs Here project in the Black Lives Matter banner initiative for the um, State College Borough and of course, the University Park campus itself. So this is extremely exciting and I'm really excited to really show you all um, those final renditions and efforts. Thank you to the community group representatives who did um, get back to me and then get approval from their e-boards. Um, and these are really important um, and I really want you all to listen to this. Um, in an effort to increase transparency and ensure a conducive assembly environment, there's a forum to give suggestions on more efficient uh, meeting procedures concerns about the climate that you didn't necessarily feel comfortable addressing in the meeting itself, or any other internal questions, comments, or concerns. Um, so please reference um, Representative Gibbard's email for that link. Um, and of course, in order to increase the efficacy of our meetings, if you have an amendment to make to a piece of legislation, please refer to Speaker Gibbard's email um, so we can facilitate those amendments and so you can submit those verbatim, because we need those word for word to implement those amendments um, into the legislation. Um, and of course, if you want to spend your Sunday with me, which I'm sure you do, um, I will be hosting work sessions for modern rules and assembly operations from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll post the Zoom link in the group me, um, and they will not end April 2nd since that already passed. They will end May 2nd. Um, so I'll do those for the next few weeks um, to ensure that you all feel comfortable navigating modern rules. And of course, just address any uh, questions or concerns that you may have about just how general assembly meetings are, uh, are ran. Um, and of course, as always, please feel free to reach out to me and please remember to take care of yourselves. Um, that being said, are there any questions on my report? Raise your hand and I will call on you. 
Okay. Seeing none. All right, we'll move on to liaison and affiliate reports. If you are a liaison or affiliate and have a report, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Okay. Seeing no old business, we will now move into a five minute caucus breakout. Please be back in five minutes um, and enjoy your break. Jason. Hey. What's up? The polar bear on GroupMe, what inspired the polar bear? Uh, so it's like polar bears are like kind of just an animal I vibe with, you know, I, I would say they're my spirit animal, but that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, but so yeah, uh, I just kind of vibe with polar bears and I found that and I'm like, oh, it's me. So <laughs> that was kind of my, my go-to icon. Apex predator. <laughs> I also have a hat, my polar bear hat that I got going through Jeremy. Where did I put that? Very nice. Yeah. Never had as much uh, polar bear related stuff. I had a little leopard seal stuffed animal when I was a kid. Oh. I also had a hat that was from Alaska. I never went to Alaska, but it was from Alaska because my aunt lives there that had a little fish going through it. So I oh. guess like lower on the food chain, <laughs> but still polar bears respectable. I think I, I read somewhere. I mean, it was probably a meme, so I don't know how credible this is. I don't know if a bio major could correct me, but uh, I think Polar bears are one of the only species that will like genuinely go after and try to eat a human. Like sharks yeah. will sometimes attack people, but it's not super common. Yeah, usually what happens is that like polar bears are extremely curious animals because you know, living up in the Arctic, they know about maybe three things. Uh, so they're they're naturally very curious. And then most of the time what happens is that when they get too close to a human, they'll start having defensive aggression. Mm-hmm. So they'll be like, oh, what's that human over there? And then get, clo get close up and then get scared and attack. <laughs> you know, sharks don't do that. Like sharks aren't curious like that. They're not gonna go up to a human because they're curious. And so they're one of the only animals that do that. Yeah, I heard there's like some expression with bears that is supposed to like help you if you encounter them. If it's black, if fight it's... back. If it's brown, yeah. lay down. If it's white, say goodnight. Yes, I was literally about to say that one. Yes, Kara. Aurora leaders for the win. Let's go. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I want. I wanted to do Aurora this past summer, but my advisor's like, "Oh, you should take." Because I'm a food science major, so my advisor's like, "Oh, you should take a GWH that actually contributes to your major." So I'm like, "Yeah, you're probably right." <laughs> no, like the I took Aurora, um, Kines eighty nine, and then Kines three six something, and those were my like favorite two classes at Penn State, and I absolutely love Aurora. It's like my favorite part of the summer. Thanks. Don't you have to be a freshman to go to those unless like you're obviously in charge of them? Yeah, so like you can only be a participant freshman year, but you can lead like all four years after that. Um, and you don't have to be a participant to be a leader. So like anyone can apply to be a leader. Yeah, and there's another one for like uh, upperclassmen, like it was called like Orion or something. Um, so I don't know if that's through Aurora because all of our programs are like only for freshmen, but I think yeah. that there might be like a Kines program that's called Ursa that's for um, non freshmen. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, it's like a sister to Aurora, or I guess sort of like a, yeah, no, a sister because it's like the same uh, parent organization of whoever does it for Penn State. Yeah, I think it's Schaefer, Schaefer's Creek um, is like where we get most of our people from, and I think that they run the other program. Oh, cool. DJ, how's your pie? Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty good. My mom made it for my birthday yesterday. Oh, happy <laughs> belated birthday. How Thank old you. are you now? I turned 21. Yes. You turned 21 on 420. Wow, what do you know? I, yeah, <laughs> good day. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, I went to Champs for it. I drove out there, went to Champs. It was a, it was a good time. How was your experience? It was good. Uh, my uh, my friend ordered me the uh, the blowjob shot, and uh, that was quite the experience. I uh, spilled coffee <laughs> all down my shirt. So, yeah. 
I, I would not have known what that was were it not for somebody else's Instagram story two weeks ago. You would have really confused me there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for some reason, even though Hope's camera's on, it doesn't have her on my first screen. Oh, Hope, you're muted. Sorry, Ashley and I are in the same room, <laughs> so I was just talking to her. Okay. Hi, <laughs> Janelle. Hi, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. Just trying to chug through the rest of this week's assignments. How about yourself? Yeah, Sam, I was pretty busy last week. I had like an exam on Friday, a take home exam due Sunday, and then another exam that happened on Monday. So now I'm chilling to like finals. So yeah. Well earned break. Mm -hmm. Look, I forget, is your, your last name is Loazo, right? Yeah, Loazo. Okay, good. Got that right. Jason, Jason Nelson, correct? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got it. Cool. Got that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm currently trying to read through an article I have to read for my 400 level class. Oh, which class is? Uh, it's like it's one unique to my lab, so it's uh, food science 497, whole genome sequencing. So yeah, I'm, it's a, cause I'm a freshman, right? I'm only in this class because of the lab, like you know, mm -hmm. my lab job. So I went from bio 110 to whole genome sequencing 497. <laughs> it, it's a little bit of a struggle, I will say. At the very okay, least, if you're gonna- That concludes the five minute caucus breakout. Um, before we do get into the next facet of internal elections, I just want to remind everyone, please turn on your cameras if you haven't already, um, just to pay respect to your fellow representatives who are running for these positions. Please also add pronouns to your names if you haven't done so already. If you have a longer name like myself, please add it um, after your first name. Um, third of all, um, as we get into these, I just want to keep everyone's attention to the notion of paying attention to your screen and the team specifically. Um, we will, of course, um, be doing the attendance forms um, like last time. Just please fill out your name. Um, of course, it ensures that there is engagement and we need reference for each election, especially if forum does dissipate. Um, as we go into these, um, I'll give you all a second to please open up the Teams and everything will be posted on the General Assembly um, with parentheses Wednesday um, channel. So please go ahead and do that now as that is how elections will begin. Um, I'm going to open up the floor and start with line item A, election for liaison to the Association of Big Ten Students. Um, I'm now opening up the floor for nominations. Please raise your hand if you would like to nominate a fellow representative. I have a point of privilege that I need to address. Please give me one second. Yes, um, I can actually punt it to the respective chairs um, that will be responsible. Is that okay with you, Representative Lestalzo? All right, that being said, I will reallocate the explanations to the Chair of Governmental Affairs, Chair Meter. Chair Meter, are you here? All right, given that Chair Meter is not responding, I can just give a quick overview. Um, ABTS is essentially um, a conference where all the Big Ten schools collaborate, um, attend conferences, and of course, keep regular communications with each other throughout the year on different initiatives, progress, and combined pieces of, of course, legislation and policy that they advocate for on a grand scale. So there is more heat to just general pieces of legislation and pushes in general. Um, Yes, of course. Thank you, Representative Wisconsin. Sorry, I just saw that. Um, with this position, of course, um, if travel is lifted, um, representatives will be able to travel to these conferences. And of course, they will be responsible for maintaining regular communications with ABTS leadership to ensure that Penn State is taking an active role in overarching um, ideas and policies that are being undertaken by our sister universities. Okay. That being said, I am now officially going to accept nominations. Um, Representative Ron Sorensen. 
Uh, Representative Ron Sorensen at large. Um, I nominate Sammy, Rep Ugh, Representative Samuel Ajah for this position. Representative Ajah, do you accept this nomination? I accept the nomination. And I see a second. All right, Representative Zhao. Hi, Kathy Zhao, Smeal College of Business. Um, I'm nominating Matt DeAngelis for this position. Thank you. Representative DeAngelis, do you accept this nomination? Uh, Matt DeAngelis at large, I accept. Thank you. Okay, I am now going to, of course, open up um, the group meetings for both candidates to return to you. And this is how I will communicate with you all. Um, please take a second to join that group me. I will give you a couple seconds to sign in and of course join. Um, we will use this as a method of communication for me to let you know when it's okay to return. Um, and of course, um, when the results are released. If you all could just unmute and let me know when you have joined the group me, we can move on to the next facet of the election. And if you haven't done so already, if you do plan on running for a position, please ensure that you are signed into the group me already. So when you click the link, it will automatically refer you to that group. Okay. And I see both of you have joined. All right, we will begin in sequential order um, with speeches. We'll begin with Representative Asia first. Representative DeAngelis, please leave the Zoom. All right, he has left. Representative Asia, you will have five minutes to speak and 10 minutes for questions. You may begin whenever you're ready and I will begin timing you now. All righty then. Yeah, I'm ready to start now. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, y'all. I'm running for ABTS for three major reasons, justice, equity, and diversity. ABTS, like UPUA, has overseen a lot in its tenure, especially with the pandemic. We, what we've seen over the last year is the stark and quite frankly terrifying inequalities present in our society, as well as how those inequalities twickle, trickle down into our communities. Over the past year, we've seen economic, racial, societal, and social inequalities permeate into our lives and quite frankly make themselves more visible to us considering they were already there to begin with. The UPUA has made major progress in tackling these issues through creation of the Justice and Equity Commission Committee, the usage of roundtables, and increasing our efforts to listen to marginalized folks as well as students of color but I think there's a lot more we can do as a student gov government. Through ABTS, I know we can strengthen our efforts to create a more e equitable, diverse, comfortable, and welcoming environment for our peers, not only for our campus, for our other sister campuses. ABTS is an institution that is well postured for dealing with matters of justice, equity, and diversity. It is very effective in its advocacy efforts and it's a, and it, and it is in an amazing place to share ideas that will continue to introduce progressive good for our peers. And I fully intend on working with the DEI community, committee as well as any other committee, committee inside of ABTS to help advocate for these progressive policies. Sharing and implementing ideas such as paying members of student government like Michigan State already does, a stipend for their, <clears throat> a stipend for their stu members of student government and, and a stipend for, a, ah, or implementing a work study program for marginalized students working in the UPUA are some of the few ideas I would like to see introduced to our campus and eventually the rest of the Big Ten schools. The University of Minnesota, one of our Big Ten schools has been ground zero for campus related organization related to the murder of George Floyd. And I would love to engage in ideal sharing with them so we can come up with better ways for advocating for justice diversity and equity. Creating a unified front between our schools to advocate for these issues, such as making election days a school holidays is what I want to be AB, what I want to bring to ABTS as well as well as what I want us to all work for. 
we can talk a good game about wanting to be an institution that advocates for justice, diversity, and equity, but we have to work hard to make that happen. And I'm more than willing to do that if chosen as our next ABTS liaison. Thank you, Representative Aja. Um, I will now open up the floor for any questions. There will be 10 minutes for the questioning period. Please raise your hand if you have a question and I will call on you. All right, Representative Flegel. Kara Flegel at large. Um, hi, Sam. So my question is that over the last few years, it's been expressed to me by multiple members of UPOA that uh, Penn State has fallen behind in regards to the Big Ten for sustainability and carbon neutrality. Um, what is your plan to get us back into the mix of the other Big Ten schools that are working to become carbon neutral in the next 10 years, along with many other sustainability initiatives? Well, thank you for the question, Kara. I think when it comes down to matter of sustainability, our other Big Ten sister schools have a lot of things that I think is willing that we need to implement. And I think they're honestly really great ideas. So I think for that matter, for your question specifically, we already have an abundant amount of ideas in our sister schools. And I think it's a matter of talking to them and figuring out, figuring out how we can implement and advocate them here in our campus. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that question, Representative Flegel, Representative Nelson. Hi, Jason Nelson, Lion Pride. So uh, you were originally reached out to me earlier today talking about how equity was something that was quite important to you. But uh, I wanted to take the time to ask, would uh, LGBT students be included in your vision of bringing further equity to the uh, Penn State through the Big Ten board? Thank you for your question. Of course, as a queer student, I think it's extremely relevant that we create safe spaces for other queer and trans students. And I definitely feel like while we were becoming a more accepting place for students, we still have a long ways to go into for making it more comfortable and making it more equitable for students to be openly queer and openly trans and so on and so forth. So yeah, I definitely agree that is something that I'm willing to fight for. Thank you so much for that question, Representative Nelson. Uh, does any other representative have a question that they would like to ask? If so, please raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, I am now going to close the floor for, dis for questions. Representative Vaja, if you would please leave the Zoom and I will let you know when you are allowed back in. Thank you. I am now inviting Representative DeAngelis back into the Zoom call. Please wait momentarily until he returns. All right, seeing that Representative DeAngelis has returned, um, Representative DeAngelis, you will have five minutes to speak and 10 minutes for questions. You may begin your speech whenever you're ready. Hello everyone. Um, I hope that you are doing well and that the stress levels are staying relatively low as we approach finals week and the end of the semester. Um, to begin, I would first like to explain like what ABTS liaison is essentially because I know that can be a little confusing, but um, ABTS liaison is essentially tasked with uh, first being the person that relays information back to the executive um, executives within UPUA to keep them updated on different legislation being proposed within ABTS as well as other universities. Um, in addition to this, the liais liaison can write legislation modeled off ABTS and other universities, which in turn can result in an overall faster process of getting resolutions and bills to the floor. And liaisons can communicate with other members of the ABTS to see how the legislation worked for their organizations and determine if that would be worth bringing back uh, to UPUA. Um, I like to describe the position of the ABTS liaison as a, a bridge between our student government and others and helping to bring new ideas to our institution and create relationships with other Big Ten student governments. Um, so my platform focuses on fostering stronger relationships with other student governments, uh, sharing ideas that have um, worked for us and adopting the ideas that can benefit our own organization. Um, in addition, I would like UPUA to play a larger role in creating legislation proposed by the ABTS. Um, Penn State is the largest Big Ten University in terms of population, 
uh, consisting of approximately 98,000 students as of 2017. Um, and although looking at legislation as recent as this past year, Penn State's name is missing from a large majority of past resolutions. Um, if elected as the liaison, it would be my top priority to make Penn State a leader of change and progress within ABTS. Um, since Penn State re represents the largest number of students among big, big 10 schools, we should make it a top priority that the legislation passed reflects what we want to see on campus. Um, concerning new legislation within the UPUA, I plan on modeling from other student government's achievements to produce concrete results that reflect progressive growth. Um, an example of this would be as simple as having wearable name tags for when we are in person next year that include pronouns so that it's easier for people to, rep um, to respect others' preferences. Um, this idea was first brought up by The Ohio State University. Um, Overall, Penn State should uh, show stronger support for legislation and resolutions within ABTS. Um, Penn State's name is missing from a, from a variety of important legislation, including, but not limited to, um, the resolution supporting the establishment of identity-based caucuses to strengthen the association of Big Ten students, um, advoca advocacy capacity, uh, support of the passage of safe transfer legislation at the state and federal level, level and the resolution calling on Big Ten universities to commit to climate conscious investments. Um, some important resolutions passed by the ABTS that I would like to bring to UPUA and implement here are um, the resolution calling on ABTS to support any Big Ten student government that advocates for a mandatory annual equity, diversity, and inclusion training, a resolution in support of incentivized cultural competency training for faculty and staff of the Big Ten, and the resolution demanding that the Big Ten universities commit to climate conscious investments. There is a wide range of opportunities that can come from being an active participant in ABTS and with hard work and dedication, as well with the support of my fellow representatives and our amazing president and vice president, I would be honored to be the bridge that will get things done. And a vote for me is a vote for results. And I promise to work hard to be the best liaison possible. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Representative DeAngelis. Um, given that speech, we will now move into a 10 minute questioning period. If you have a question um, that you'd like to ask Representative DeAngelis, please raise your hand and I will call on you. We will begin with Representative Flegel. Kara Flegel at large. Um, hi, Matthew, thank you for running. Um, my question is, how do you plan like tangibly to make Penn State more connected with the other Big Ten schools? Uh, just like specifically, what actions are you gonna take to increase our involvement? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think that personally, I want to have a um, meeting almost every single week with the other Big Ten schools liaisons um, and focus on um, putting forth legislation that uh, collaboratively, so we all are on the same page and getting things done together. And I know um, like in the past, obviously Penn State has been almost absent from the table in regards to ABTS and the legislation that they're passing. And I think a large part of that was just the lack of communication between the previous liaisons and um, their involvement in the organization, uh, referencing ABTS. And um, I think that we can actually do a lot more um, like Penn State wise in the ABTS since we are the largest uh, school and a lot of their um, legislation that they do put uh, forth does impact us. So by us just standing idly by and letting things happen without us there is um, something that I don't uh, really want to happen at all. So just having that active conversation and uh, making sure that we are there and we are listening and we're giving what um, we want done, but also receiving things from their end as well. I think that's really important. Thank you, Representative Flegel. Does any other representative have a question they would like to ask? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. All right. Seeing no further questions, Representative DeAngelis, I will now ask that you leave the Zoom call and I will message you whenever you are okay to return for the results. Seeing that Representative DeAngelis has left the Zoom call, we will now move into general discussion, beginning with reasoning for nominations. We'll begin in sequential order. I will begin with Representative Ron Sorensen. Will you please explain your nomination? 
Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, so every time that I have a conversation with Sam Ajah, I am just absolutely blown away by his ideas, his positive attitude, and his rationalism. Um, he's incredibly observant. He's driven. And he's passionate as well. Um, and I mentioned that he's observant because in this role, he could use everything that he's learning and noticing about what other Big Tens or schools are doing to help UPUA benchmark our advocacy efforts to push them forward. Um, sometimes other schools are ahead of us on initiatives that we should be involved in to help better student life and life in general. Uh, but with Sam at the helm of our relationships with other Big Ten schools, I really think that we would be on the same page faster. Um, Sam also has already has knowledge about how ABTS works um, and what it does. So this is like especially essential for smooth and productive transitions. So Sam's leadership roles at Penn State and his experience have really refined his outreach and communication skills, which is vital for someone stepping into the ABTS liaison role. Um, Sam is the executive vice president for the College Democrats at Penn State, where he is responsible, directly responsible for our outreach, recruitment, um, our relationships with media. Um, and he also has experience with UPA, and I think that they would both be um, invaluable uh, stepping into this role. So ABTS also requires someone who can bring a unique perspective to the table. The Big, the Big Ten itself is a predominantly white organization. Um, I know that UPA is committed to comprehensively representing every student here at Penn State and to increasing diversity in leadership positions. We should all strive to create more equitable and inclusive spaces wherever we can. Sam is a fearless advocate for the things he cares about like representation, representation for black students and other students of color and queer students. Sam was actually the first person outside of my class closest friends who I came out to, so I, so I know firsthand that he can be trusted with, with fostering these inclusive spaces. Sam is inspiring, motivated, passionate, and supremely qualified for, the, for this position. Sam motivates me every day, so I can't wait to see what he does with ABTS if we all choose him. Thank you, Representative Ron Sorensen. Representative Zhao, will you please explain your nomination? Hi, everybody. Um, so the reason why I'm standing here before you all today is because I wholeheartedly believe that Matt DeAngelis is the best person for this job. Uh, let me explain why. So Matt is one of the most borough um, and with downtown State College is extremely essential. Um, so if you're interested in this and you feel like you can be a good advocate. To the fact that they know about the referendum results, um, but we just really want to keep a fire on administration and saying that fossil fuel divestment is something that students are passionate about. And it's something that students voted um, to agree with on the, on the referendum question. In terms of next steps, uh, I would like to see UPA collaborate with CCSG to get, a, to get like, um, I guess, an idea of what Penn Staters across the Commonwealth think about in terms of divestment. Um, and that's something that I would love to collaborate with Executive Director Matazuski on. Um, and other key pet players who have helped really get this conversation started within UPA. Um, and I also got a text from President Bose asking to lend time to answer this as well. So I will lend time to President Bose. Hi, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to inform everyone, especially the new members that might not be fully aware of, of kind of the relationship between the legislative and executive branch. Um, at the end of the day, any kind of policy or, or re resolution that, that you bring forward it's my job and, and Vice President Rodriguez's job as well um, to bring it to the university. So for example, um, I was actually gonna reach out to, to Representative Robertson after this meeting because I just received an email today about um, a meeting with um, representatives from the University Investment Council as well as Sarah Thorndike, who is the um, Vice President of Finance. So for example, um, those, these types of conversations would go straight into administration and it would be Vice President Rodriguez and I um, job to effectively communicate that to the administration. There is a point of information, um, and please refer to that. That's just the overall statement on the context of what's being brought forth today. Um, I'll read that out loud just so everyone can, of course, hear this. The referendum was already adopted last assembly. This resolution just proposes we deliver the results to admin and reforms our support for divestment and transparency, which we adopted last year a couple of times. Thank you, Representative Zhang, for that. We'll now go in order from what I see in the queue. Representative Reynolds. Joshua Reynolds at large, thank you. Um, Representative Robertson. I think we talked very recently uh, and the conversation of, of the referendum came up and university action came up and you express a difficulty in the need to get other student government organizations to likewise 
pass a statement or to hold some form of referendum. So what plans do you have to get action from CCSG and or to develop a better relationship with CCSG for future collaboration? Thank you for that question. And so I also wanna clarify that um, while we will be reaching out to CCSG, they are not the only Penn State student government that um, we will hopefully be collaborating with, the others being GPSA and World Campus Student Government, um, and also hopefully now working with Representative DeAngelis to bring this conversation to ABTS and uh, help it in that space as well. Um, but in terms of our, our connection with CCSG, um, I believe that they have a committee on climate action or a committee on sustainability that we could reach out to um, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone knows, but I believe the, the student's name is Gabe Schaefer, who is the director of sustainability for CCSG. Um, so we'll be reaching out to whoever fills, whoever's in that position um, and just getting like maybe a joint resolution in support of fossil fuel divestment from all four Penn State student governments. Thank you. Representative Luazo. Hi, Janelle Luazo, Black Caucus. Hi, Noah. Um, as you know, the university does have a lot on their plate this past year with like the racism, um, COVID and their finding of a new president. Um, with this Reverend, I know this is like another push for the university to take accountability, but how much pressure do you want to put on the, the administration to um, make credit, like what's your timeline for them to actually make new efforts and how will you let other students be in the know about this cause for action? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think your question touched on how chaotic of a world we live in, right? We have so many different things that the university has to consider, um, especially as we transition back to an in-person uh, like learning format. Um, so. I, I don't really think that there's a perfect time to address environmental sustainability and rather it's something that we should all be looking to address in any way we can, whenever we can. Um, and this resolution, you know, I don't think that this resolution in itself is going to get the board of trustees um, or President Barron to put out a response, but what it does is it kind of lights a fire and says, this is an issue that students are passionate about um, and students have expressed support for divestment and we will continue to express support for divestment until you know, we at least get a public comment. Um, in terms of a timeline, um, I think this speaks on maybe my philosophy of student advocacy, which is students aren't the experts on this. Like we're not the subject matter experts when it comes to fossil fuel divestment. Um, I'll leave that to uh, Joe Colin and the other members of the Penn State Investment Council, but really we're here to promote that shared vision put forward by the, climate, the Penn State Climate Action Petition uh, which seeks to uh, deliver Penn State to a more sustainable um, system and with more sustainable policies. Uh, so what we can do is we can push for more knowledgeable um, adultier adults to be in those rooms who have more education regarding fossil fuel divestment or climate action uh, to help inform members of the Penn State Investment Council to make those divestment calls and to put forward that timeline. So I, it's not something that we would create as students, but it's something that we can pressure administration to create with the right resources. Thank you, Representative Luazo. I will now move to Representative Constein. Hi, thank you, Seth Constein, at large rep. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the point that states um, this would improve efforts to incorporate sustainability education into the existing curriculum. Of course, so this is something that I am really passionate about and I'm looking forward to uh, continuing talks with Dr. Brandy Robinson. Um, in fact, I had a meeting with President Bose and Speaker Gibbard um, and Brandy on like what type of work Faculty Senate is doing through their Curricular Affairs Committee. I know that this is also work that um, Chair, um, that, sorry, uh, the, Oh my God, I'm blanking. This is a lot. This is work that academic affairs has addressed in general. Um, and Chair Flegel has really been pushing for this last year. Um, so I'll, I'll be working to continue in kind of light of their advocacy in faculty senate under their direction and guidance. Um, and what that could look like is maybe introducing things like sustainability education requirements through gen eds maybe through reevaluating what CAS 100 looks like uh, in terms of 
do we want a student speech required speech to be about the UN 17 sustainable development goals, uh, which would ultimately serve the purpose of giving each Penn State student a working vocabulary of uh, things related of sustainability topics and domains. Um, so it's really considering what options exist within Faculty Senate for us to pursue those goals of including sustainability education into the existing curriculum at Penn State. And I could also lend time to uh, Chair Flegel as well. Thank you, Chair Flegel. Chair Flegel at large. Um, yeah, so one of the big things that I was working on last year was something called Climate Crossover. Uh, what Climate Crossover is, is it's an opportunity for already existing faculty and classes to meet with students um, or experts in sustainability and integrate sustainability education into their pre-existing curriculum. For example, if there was a statistics class, um, they would be able to uh, talk about problems regarding maybe like fossil fuel and statistics. So basically the point of it is not trying to force sustainability onto people in a way that they're not familiar with, but instead trying to integrate it into their already existing education. Another thing is the um, institution of a sustainability major. This was something I was talking with faculty senate about last semester. And this mostly deals with making um, potentially a Shire honors option in which students can uh, fulfill a sustainability major like S requirement on some of their classes. And this would ultimately in the long run add up to a full sustainability major that students can take. So the main goal with integrating sustainability into our education is not to force it or just like pack sustainability onto everyone in a way that they're not really familiar with. It's to integrate it into their existing education and make sure that everyone's receiving a sustainability education based off of what they came here to learn. Thank you. Thank you. And are there any further questions for Representative Robertson? Seeing none, I will now close the floor for questions and I will now open up the floor for discussion. Is there any discussion on the resolution here tonight? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Representative Zhang. Yeah, uh, Stephen Zang at large. I wanted to address a, a few points. Um, first, just like with all the comments about the uh, resolution and the action plans for, for this specific resolution, um, I would potentially, if, if anyone has any questions, thoughts or additional concerns about it, or, or just kind of like want a bigger overview of it, um, number one, I definitely encourage you to reach out to Executive Director Chaudhary to look at last year's resolutions because um, again, this is like a continuation of something that we worked on last year where um, we did a resolution that was a lot more comprehensive with the um, with climate action. We supported the climate action plan that's on the climate action petition um, and, and all of the other uh, more comp like actually putting things out on the table. But one of the things that happened last year was we didn't get a, a proper response from the board of trustees. So this is an addition onto that where, to, where we kind of thought like, okay, let's do a referendum and make that an additional advocacy slash pressure point um, to, to address some of the concerns we had last year. So if you wanted to, here, I'll, I'll send the link. That's the climate action link uh, with all of their steps. And, and like, that's the, that's the organization that has been working on this and UPA really just tried to support it additionally. So all the points that they wanted to ask for uh, or they were fighting for and the petitions fighting for can be found there um, in terms of action items. Um, but another thing I want to speak on, this was like in no fault of, of uh, Representative Robertson, was that uh, we did have a bit of miscommunications like when we were trying to introduce this resolution in that um, not a, a, a few members of the climate action group weren't informed of this resolution coming forward. So they were a bit confused and there was like a bit of reaching out to kind of clarify with me um, and Representative Robertson about like why they weren't reached out to. And again, it's, it's no fault of, of Representative Robertson. I think these miscommunications happen from time to time, but it's so important to, to make sure that, um, just as an example for other representatives that as you're moving forward, make sure to give people credit when they, uh, when they are doing work, make sure that people who have been there from the start are continuously looped in. Again, like, uh, like this time it was an accident, um, but at times like historically in UPA, there have been issues with people not getting credit or not being looped in near the middle or end of a project and then having communities that are that are um, you know unsatisfied with what we're trying to produce especially because they weren't along the entire way especially if we're trying to advocate for them i'm always an advocate for elevating voices instead of advocating for other people um, i think that it's always important to just keep that in mind thank you representative zhang um i do have a motion that i need to address first 
Um, I will be submitting a poll on that motion. Um, please I have a point vote of on information. Could I add something? Yes, to Representative that? Robertson. Okay, I, it's mostly just the, the link that um, Representative Zhang sent in the chat. If you want to check out all of the other footnotes, um, would highly recommend. It, it also links to the climate action petition and uh, maybe point of information about like the, the communication too. Just so everyone's aware, there is like, there's a Microsoft Teams and a GroupMe, and we're really emphasizing like strong uh, intra Penn State organization communication related to the fossil fuel divestment advocacy. Um, and this was just a mishap that this happened today uh, with one member of the, the um, climate action group um, that it just kind of slipped like their mind about like the resolution that was coming. Um, so the communication is very highly emphasized and something that will be prioritized moving forward. Okay. Is all right, seeing that the motion is there, anyone have an objection to that? If not, I will take general consensus and close discussion. Okay, seeing no objection. Okay, and I have a motion to address and vote by unanimous consent. There is a second. Okay, the motion is passed. Um, congratulations. We will now move on to a report by the Chief Justice. Chief, Chief Justice Zaya, you may now speak and- Wait, point of order. Yes. Aren't we supposed to have a discussion on a motion like that? I know that like people are like saying six, like all this stuff in the chat, but like, aren't we supposed to discuss it anyway? Okay, it's a little hard to keep track of that. Um, So sorry about that. What I will say is if we could just, of course, have one person second, and I understand it, it is funny, yes, but just so I can keep track of everything while facilitating this, is there an objection to motion by unanimous consent? If so, please raise your hand and we can open up into discussion. Um, and also that is a good question. Um, it is the chair's prerogative to like interpret if there is not general consensus on something, hence like us moving forward. But that was a really good um, point of procedure that you brought up. Could I add one other thing in too? Sorry. If yes, is it pertinent to the motion? Um, it's, it's about like the two thirds. I just wanted to clarify that there was like about like bringing stuff by two thirds versus going through committee. I forgot to mention in the speech. Uh, would you be comfortable saving that for just comments for the good of the order given yeah. the okay. steps Sorry. that we're at? Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, so I don't see a need for us to go into the discussion. There has been no objection that I've seen, meaning that I will use general consensus. Thank you all though. Um, we will now hear a report by Chief Justice Zaya. Um, Zaya, you may need... So I, there is a point of inquiry. Um, we're ending discussion because there was a motion to pass by unanimous consent. Um, due to that, um, we will move on to the next line item. Um, uh, I see. We ended discussion because there was a motion to end discussion. Due to that motion and due to there being no objection, I took general consensus. So we moved on to the next step of voting. Um, there was a motion to pass by unanimous consent. Therefore, there was no objection to that. And then therefore it's passed by the UPA. But thank you for that. Um, Representative Reynolds, um, we're gonna move on with the agenda. Representative Luazo, did that address your point of inquiry? Um, yes and no, I just want like an actual reason. So like if Representative Reynolds can explain that, that would be great. Yes, I would just say, I don't want it to devolve into that. It's just modern rules. Um, that's the system that we are, that's the system that is utilized by this. So since he did make that motion and since no one objected, um, Representative Reynolds, that is not necessary. Um, just, just for the efficiency of the meeting and the time, I saw no objection. Therefore we use the modern rules of order to then move on to the voting, um, the voting process. Then there was a motion for unanimous consent. Hence we are here. I can't revert back since there was no objection. Um, I hope that adds further clarification. I'm sorry, it's just a matter of procedure. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Blazo. I will now move into the judicial report. We will now hear a report by Chief Justice Zaya. Chief Justice Zaya, you may unmute yourself and begin whenever you're ready. Hey everyone, hope you're all having a great week. Uh, not really much coming from the judicial branch uh, in that I'm the only justice as of right now. Uh, however, we have four other returning associate justices 
and the applications for the remaining four seats close uh, this Saturday. And I stand for any other questions that anyone may have. Are there any questions for Chief Justice Zaya? If there is, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Okay, seeing none, we will now move into executive reports. Are there any executive reports? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Chief of Staff Jordan. Hi everyone, um, Sarah Jordan, Chief of Staff. I don't know if I said that, but um, so a few things for me. Um, on Sunday, I sent out a swipe to the office. Um, please everyone fill that out by Friday at the latest so I can get you all swiped um, to the office. Um, if you perhaps like are in say college and just wanna come um, in the office before that, like someone's always in here. So just maybe text me, group me, um, be sure to like let you all in. Um, but you'll be getting swiped after I send the form back to um, the hub. So I'll let you know that happens. Um, and then one more thing, also tomorrow, um, we are doing a hub tabling event on the patio for um, sustainable, sustainable transportation um, from 12 to one. So if you're around, um, come say hi, I'll be there. Um, we're, we're tabling with TRIP um, and the Transportation Commission. So that will be exciting. And then lastly, um, excited to get the executive department up and running with our meetings. So that will be fun, um, but I'll keep you all posted on that. Um, but other than that, have a great night. We're in the home stretch, not saying for any other questions. Are there any questions for Chief of Staff Jordan? Seeing none, we will now move into the speaker report. Um, we will now hear a report by Speaker Gibbard. Speaker Gibbard, you may begin whenever you're ready. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so first of all, um, please sign up for one-on-ones, even if you are signing up for them that aren't until after finals, it's just good for me to see so that I can like account for, like you have decided on whether you'd like to meet with me before or after finals. Um, I will be sending out another link um, in the one -on to the one-on-one -on -one sheet um, and my email that I'll be sending out next Monday. Um, I really apologize for the number of emails I sent you about um, policies and the budget and everything. Um, I just have to get that information to you seven days in advance. And I hope I was kind of being clear about um, when you're actually voting on those policies. But if you're ever confused, please text me and I'll explain it. I have had like probably seven or eight people text me um, over the past few days just asking me like what they're voting on this week versus what they're voting on next week. So if you're ever confused, please feel free to reach out. Um, Another thing is that um, make sure you look over the budget and look over those, um, the changes that we made. Um, it's really great if you can have those questions prepared for when we come to next week, or if you ask them advanced so that we can make um, assembly next week as efficient as possible. I don't, I don't want to have to extend past 10 p.m. the week before finals. I know that everyone's very stressed and like that should be your main focus. Um, so if you do that beforehand, it'll be really great. Um, other than that, um, if you have any questions about modern rules, reach out to um, Vice President Rodriguez or myself. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you, Speaker Gibbard. Are there any questions for Speaker Gibbard? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Seeing none, we will now move on to comments of the committees. We will now begin with Academic Affairs and Chair Richardson. Hi everybody, uh, not too much from a a AAC this week. Uh, see my email or my uh, executive report at the bottom of the agenda for most of the relevant information. Also see my email to the assembly. Um, we have committee tomorrow at 7.30 and we will be having uh, vice chair elections. So remember that you need to be nominated for those as we've reiterated. Um, for, any more, for more information on that, see uh, Sydney's email to everybody, the first one. Sorry about that, Sydney. Um, and yeah, that's all. Thank you, Chair Richardson. We will now move into facilities with Chair Flegel. Uh, hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Facilities Committee will be meeting tomorrow at 6 p.m. Um, even if you're unsure if you want to be on facilities or not, please come. It's going to be a fun time. Just learn what we're about. Uh, during our first committee, we will be electing our vice chair and go over the structure for how we're going to be sharing information along with general expectations. Um, for those interested in running in vice chair, just a reminder that you must be nominated for the position once the chair opens the floor. And further, the person who gets elected must be able to stay after committee for 30 minutes in order to go over onboarding with me. 
Um, after Thursday, be on the lookout for two on one signups with me and the new vice chair, along with an interest and availability form I'll be sending out shortly after committee. Um, another thing this week is Earth Week, so please check out some of the events many of the sustainability organizations are hosting. You can find those on the UPUA social media. If anyone's interested in running for moving on liaison, please either contact me or President Bose. Um, the last thing is we're currently working on lift subsidy vouchers for the end of the semester, so expect to see that cut bill come by two thirds through steering. Uh, I can't wait to see you all tomorrow. Please come if you're interested and as always never hesitate to reach out. Um, have a great night everyone and get some sleep once we're all done. Thank you, Chair Flegel. We'll now move on to governmental affairs with Chair Meter. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd first like to say congrats to Representative Sam Aja on his election to vice chair. Um, I can't wait to work with you. Um, you're going to do such a great job. It's going to be a great semester or a great year. Um, next is um, the deadline to apply for mail-in ballots for the municipal primary elections is May 11th. Um, if you want to vote in state college, if you're registered in state college, but you won't be able to vote from here, if you're going to be back home, um, please submit your application for your mail-in ballot. Um, if you are not sure how to do that, please reach out to me for help. Um, we will have committee meeting on Tuesday at 6. During that meeting, we will be discussing ways that we can advertise um, the mail-in ballot deadline to students um, and do a lot of outreach for that. Um, we will also be having our federal state liaison elections. Um, if you're interested in running for that and have any questions or want more information, please reach out to me. Um, I will be sending out information soon about two-on-one signups with me and Sam. Um, so please look out for that. I'm also currently constructing our Teams um, channel as well as the Google Drive. Um, I sent out a link for the Teams channel. Please make sure you join that as well as the GroupMe link that I sent out. Um, and you should be seeing more information within those channels soon. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. Thank you, Chair Meter. We will now move into the Committee on Justice and Equity with Chair Kuller. Hello, everyone. Hope you had a great night. Um, j and &E will be having our first meeting at 4.30 p.m. this Friday. So please, please, please come out if you're interested. It'll be a great time, I promise. Um, that being said, committee might look a little different. Um, I just got confirmation from Penn State Hillel that um, they're the Jewish student organization on campus. Um, they will be coming and speaking at committee about legislation that they're writing. So I'm super excited about that. Other than that, vice chair elections will also be happening. So if you're interested, remember that you have to be nominated and everyone else, please know your voting status. Um, check Speaker Gibbard's email for more information on that. Um, and then outside of that, uh, I had a, like Vice President, Vice President Rodriguez said, um, I was also in the meeting with UHS to talk about the voucher initiative and the Health Equity Center. And I think we've made a lot of great progress on that. So I'm super excited to see where that goes. And then please reach out to me if you're interested in learning more about the initiative. I'd love to talk to you about it. And then the Community Diversity Liaison, reach out to me if you want more information on that. I will reach out to the different committees that you're, different organizations you're supposed to be sitting on and get back to you with more information on that. And then, yeah, other than that, please reach out to me if you have any questions, concerns, or just wanna talk, I'm always open and yeah, have a great rest of your week. Thank you, Chair Kuller. We will now move on to the Committee of, on Student Life with Chair Brown, Chair Brown. Hi everyone. Um, so just to start off, um, it is Earth Week and one of the things that is occurring is swipe out hunger. So if you're a student and you're on campus and you have extra meal points, please um, consider donating. You can donate up to $15 of your meal points to the Student Emergency Fund, which is extremely important. So please, please look into that. Next week, Thursday, April 29th at 6.30 is Night of Remembrance. If you don't, want, don't know what Night of Remembrance is, it's a candlelit vigil to honor students that have passed this past year um, with a lot of student organization presidents speaking. And it's just going to be a really beautiful event on Old Main Lawn. I highly suggest you coming. And I will be talking more about involvement with student life and that event on Sunday at 11 a.m. I'm so excited. So many of you guys like the message. Can't wait to meet with you all here. I hear your ideas. There will be a lot of you. So just come prepared so we can get to everyone and talk about everything. Um, get ready for vice chair elections 
And yeah, I'm super pumped. Thank you, Chair Brown. And with that, are there any questions directed to any chairs of the committees? If so, please raise your hand, but if not, I will move on. Seeing no questions directed to any of the chairs, I will now move on to comments for the good of the order. Are there any comments for the good of the order? If so, please raise your hand and I will call on you. Speaker Gibbard. Hi, okay. Um, I just forgot one thing for my report and then I have something else. So one is that everyone has to fill out their committee preferences by Sunday at 1 p.m. at the latest. This allows you like an hour after student life is done um, to submit those. We just need to have them by steering because we will be um, like officially assigning you to all your committees on Sunday um, in steering. And um, attendance will be taken um, next week at assembly for the first time. So um, I just want you to all be aware of that. Um, and I'll let you know in the email as well again. Um, Okay, the other thing other than my report is that faculty senate is next Tuesday. So if you were an, a faculty senator um, or a student senator in faculty senate in the 15th assembly, you were required to attend. That's the last faculty senate meeting of your um, kind of tenure, I guess. Um, but at the same time, um, I know that um, Chair Richardson um, uh, and Aaron and I have been talking about um, the possibility for new academic reps to shadow um, faculty Senate. So if you're interested in that, um, reach out to either chair, the previous chair Barunji or chair Richardson, and they can set you up with a committee meeting that you can go and visit. Um, also student caucus is open up to everyone. And so is the full plenary meeting. Um, just to give you a sense of the times on Tuesday, committee meetings are in the morning. Um, and then the student caucus is from 12 to 1 PM. And then the full plenary meeting, which is all the faculty senators. Um, and like you'll hear President Barron and Vice Provost Nick Jones speak there. Um, that is at 1 p.m. and it usually goes to like 4.30 or 5, but you don't have to stay the whole time. Um, but if you're interested in that, reach out to any one of us and we can put you into contact and give you the link for that. I'll also put it in the group meet. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Speaker Gibbard, uh, Representative Robertson. Hi everyone. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of clarification for like how the resolution got onto the agenda tonight. So, um, what I did was last week I sent this out, the resolution out, um, so you all had a chance to review it um, about a week, but typically like when you want to bring legislation, you should do it through committee um, and that just helps get the most amount of eyes on it as possible. And that's like the more typical way to do it. Uh, when we were discussing whether or not to put the item on the agenda for this week, that was one concern of like newer members only seeing like a resolution coming by two thirds versus going through committee. So I just wanted to make that distinction clear that like uh, two thirds legislation, I guess should be reserved for pretty like pressing things um, or things that come up kind of, yeah, just like more pressing things. But uh, yeah, so just like follow typical committee structure was something that was um, kind of advised to mention during the presentation, uh, but I forgot to, so I am mentioning it now. Thank you, Representative Robertson. Uh, Representative Round Sorensen. Uh, hi, I just wanted to like re like emphasize what uh, Chair Meter was talking about. Um, the the deadline is like coming up, and it's super important that we all vote because we're not going to be on campus. Um, I highly recommend copying and pasting that link and saving it. Going at like emailing your professors and asking if you can talk at the beginning of class and letting people know that there is an election happening when they are not on campus, so they should request a ballot. This isn't like some like abnormal thing either. Like this is what we did in 20, uh, 2019 when there was a special election happening. This is like the same procedure. So like, just please copy and paste that link, send it to like as many people as possible. Um, it's, it's really important that we all vote. And so, yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that message. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Ron Sorensen, Representative Luazo. Hi, um, Janelle Ozo, uh, Black Caucus. I just wanted to um, advertise that next week is Black Caucus is now more than every week for the 20th anniversary of the village protest. If you do not know what the village protest was, it is it was the 10 day protest where students of color and other students sat in the hub for 10 days straight because the university refused to um, sign their demands on the way. Um, it's a whole week of events and I really want you guys to like really advocate for it because obviously it was 20 years ago and it, and we're still trying to like push for change from the university. If you have any more questions about um, now more in every week or the village protest, feel free to contact me. 
Thank you. And I would highly second uh, doing that. Um, are there any other comments for the good of the order? Seeing none, Secretary, would you please take closing roll call? Yes, one second, let me just get it up. Okay. Um, Aaron Bose. Here. Najee Rodriguez. Here. Arthi Kalor. Here. Alea Federoff. Here. Anne Marie Round Sorensen. Here. Brandon Walker. Here. Kara Flagel. Here. Carter Gangle. Here. Kathy Zhao. Here. David Morgan. Here. Donald Impavito. Here. Em Emmanuel Almonte. Here. Hope Steger. Here. Sorry. <laughs> Holden Ingalls. Um, Jasmine Boldick. Here. Jason Nelson. Here. Janelle Luazo. Here. Jordan Dibler. Here. George Durango Espin. Here. Joshua Reynolds. Here. Caitlin Farrar. Here. Kyle Quinn. Lakin Meter. Here. Lewis Richardson. Here. Marie Missiner. Here. Marissa Gillespie. Here. Matthew DeAngelis. Here. Megan Neely. Here. Michael DeBoten. Here. Michael Jablonski. Noah Robertson. Here. Patricia Barangi. Here. Raina Alexander. Here. Refugio Lara. Here. Ryan Lascalzo. Samantha Brown. Here. Samuel Aja. Here. Sean Terry. Here. Selena Go. Here. Seth Kornstein. Here. Steven Zhang. Here. Sydney Gibbard. Here. Was, Was anybody there anybody's called? Okay. That being said, meeting is adjourned at Wednesday, April 21st at 1131. Have a great night. There we go. Have a good one, everybody. Only a 10% yeah. deduction. Have a good one. Just, that's all right. <laughs> night. Good night, everybody.